I want to just, uh, if there's anybody left out in the foyer, call them on in. Praise the Lord. Get them in here. We'll get this fired up. Who's ready to praise the Lord tonight and worship? Amen. Now, uh, I mean, of course we don't have the choir tonight, but this lady here doesn't have to take a back seat to anybody. We, uh, we've been blessed with her uh, worshiping with us in camp meetings. Of course, she worships over at Grace PCG, and uh, I think she will lead us very well in worship. Amen. Uh, maybe a uh, sister pastor might get up there and lead with her. Who knows? And then if she goes up, Rhonda could go up. And pretty soon this, hey, we just have the choir going again. <laughs> Hallelujah. I am still on fire about the choir. I mean, seriously. That was, to me, that was just a, a beginning of something really, really great is happening. Amen. And I'm excited about it. I'm already looking forward to next year. I want to see that full. That way the next year after that, they have to build another riser on there. Where's Brother Chris? He's like, oh, that man. <laughs> uh, is there any urgent prayer request? I'm talking urgent ones. Urgent, if there's an urgency. I have one. I would like for you to be in prayer for Pastor Reisner. He is our founding father of the Pentecostal Church of God. Just just be in prayer for him. He lost his precious wife about four weeks ago. They have been together uh, for decades. I mean, they've just been together forever. They did ministry together. They pastored the same church for 50 years. That just doesn't happen. Amen? The same church for 50 years. Uh, so they, they, uh, he, he just misses her. Uh, is he mourning? I don't even know if you could call it that. He, he, just, he just lost without her. Amen? So remember him in prayer. Okay? Good to see each and every one of you. And if you'll stand with me, we are going to go to the Lord. Those of you who weren't here today, I feel sorry for you that you didn't make it. You missed out on some good stuff. Uh, Big Chief showed up for a little while today uh, with full headgear on. I, I think they've, they've hid my headgear. But yes, Big Chief was in it. Ooh. That's a little dangerous. I might get in the mood. Um, Pastor Terry just told me a little bit ago, he said, you know, after they reelected you as the bishop, he said, I almost told you, now put the big chief headgear on. You're still the chief. Amen? And I said, that would have been a good time. But those of you who were here, those of you who weren't, uh, we appreciate your confidence to reelect us for another term. We thank you for your vote of confidence. Uh, it is very, very humbling, uh, and you instantly start to feel the responsibility. Amen? And uh, if it weren't for the Lord, I don't guess any of us would even be able to even walk with the Lord and serve Him. So it's all in God's hands. Amen? We love you. Bow your heads for a moment, and let's just welcome the Holy Spirit. I know He's with us, but let's welcome Him to have His way in here. I really want Him to have His way in here. I'd like for Him to really move upon Zeke. And I'd like for Zeke just to yield and let the Holy Ghost have his way in him. I know, Father, that you've called this young man. I believe, God, that you've anointed him to preach the Word of God. I believe, God, that he is a preacher of thy Word. I believe he's made a choice to surrender his heart and his life unto you. And he has made a choice to serve you in the leadership in which you've called him. And God, we just pray over the service tonight. We welcome you, Holy Ghost. Have your way in this place. Have your way, Holy Spirit, in this place. Move on every heart tonight. Help us to become free as we lift up voices of praise to worship you tonight. We thank you, Lord, so much for all of your goodness, all of the security that we have in the salvation of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah, name above every name. You are the name of victory. 
No doubt you are the name of healing. Salvation is found in the name of the Lord. We declare tonight uh, that we have come here to worship you. Uh, we've come here to lift our voices of praise unto you. In Jesus' mighty name tonight, we shall surrender unto your will. Church, let's all shout a great big Amen. Hallelujah. Give him a hand clap of praise. We're going to let him worship the King. Praise the Lord. Aren't you thankful today? I'm just wanting to come and worship. I can already feel the Holy Spirit up here. So let's just worship Him. Sing, I never shall forget the day. Because I know I'll never forget the day that the Lord saved me. I never shall forget the day.
and he truly is a good, a good father to us. You know, I can't relate to having a good earthly father. I didn't have a good natural earthly father, and my stepfather surely was not a good loving father. So for me to grasp about God being a father, I didn't have that concept because that was not my perception because of the world and because of sin in this world distorted what that means to have a good father. I'm so thankful Thank you, Lord. that he shows us who he is. Amen. He shows us the love and the compassion that only a good father can do. And I just want to take this time to just worship him and to praise him and to thank him for who he is because I wouldn't be here without him. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think your life, but I've heard the tender Good, good father, 
that blood that covers all sins. No matter what you've been through, no matter what you've gone through, your circumstance in your life, it's that blood that will cover it all. Oh man, you know, I, as a young kid, when I first heard that song, I got to think, you know, something that's white, how can it, how can, you know, blood that's red cover and make it all white again? I don't know. But let me tell you, he knows because he paid the price. Uh, that's one thing with me I can never forget about Calvary's cross and the price he paid. I know we did communion earlier, but let me tell you, it's something every time. I don't take it lightly, and I'm very, very thankful for the Lord and the price he's paid. Uh, I do have a couple people coming up to share and testify and to share with us first. I, like I said, I'm very thankful for you guys and everything that you guys have done for us, those that showed up time after time, helping us through everything, every little event that we did. Thank you. I can never repay you, but let me tell you, if he can in heaven. Uh, you don't understand. You may not see the fruit of it all, but let me tell you, this past camp, it was worth it all. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you guys for everything. Thank you for showing up tonight. It means a lot to me. I don't take it lightly. Once again, those ministers that are here, the board, thank you guys. I appreciate it. I'm glad that, you know, I'm very honored. I'm glad that you guys have enough trust in me to, to keep going with this. And uh, I'm going to have House of Grace come up. They're going to testify for us or for you guys and share with us what's going on. You guys can come ahead. I was excited when Brother Zeke asked if the girls would be interested in testifying, and I always have to ask them because sometimes they just freak out. And I could always say yes, and then have to deal with that later, but they're usually always willing to share a little bit about what God's doing because of His blood. God has done some hum huge things, tremendous things in these ladies' lives, and um, we're just going to let them share a minute um, about what's happening with them. Okay, my name is Caitlin. I'm 21. I'm from Crawfordsville. I was raised in a Christian home with my grandmother. I attended church on Sundays and knew who Christ was. Once my teenage years started, I got introduced to the drug scene and everything that comes with it. That shortly led to my arrest on October 10, 2018. I was desperate for something different and new. Uh, in a new way of living. That's when I applied to the House of Grace, and shortly after, I had my interview with Tammy, and I instantly knew that God was leading me to the House of Grace. I left everything I was going through in God's hands, and I knew that He had a plan for me, a better plan than I had ever imagined. I've been at the House of Grace for five months, and I've learned a new way of living, and that's living through Christ. Um, my name is Casey Abston. I'm 23 years old and I'm from Frankfort, Indiana. I have one brother and two sisters by my mother and father. In 2015, something very traumatic happened that changed the course of my life. I lost my stepmom and my dad a month apart, and instead of turning towards God, I turned my back on him, although I was grown in the church. Um, my life became consumed with my addiction, confusion, and guilt. I felt unworthy and like I'd betrayed God. So I continued using and caught my first charge at 21. March of this year, I violated probation. By July, I had violated four times. July 19th, I turned myself in because I knew I needed something much more than what I or anyone else could give me besides God. I entered a two-month drug program and began searching for recovery homes to further my recovery process. September 6th, my father's birthday, Another inmate had left the application to the House of Grace on my cell desk, and I began fi uh, filling it out. Mind you, I didn't read who ran the program until I finished it. Filling it out, and as soon as I did, I began weeping with joy because my dad knew Tammy very well before he passed, and God knew very well where I needed to be. It's like God and my dad got together and just knew this is where I was supposed to be. 
I've been at the House of Grace for one month, and I'm excited to see what God has in store for me, and I'm curious to see how the House of Grace is going to shape me. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cody. Um, I'm from Mooresville, Indiana. I'm 29 years old. I have one son. I come from a good family. wasn't really raised in church. Um, I uh, got arrested last year. Uh, it was end of May. I got my son taken away from DCS. Um, when I got out, uh, I didn't really have a place to go because uh, my parents took my son and. and so I was out there doing the most, and then my fiancé uh, that I had a child with, I was with him for nine years, he ended up passing away from overdose. Um, October 24th of this year will be one year of his death. Um, since I've been at the House of Grace, I am getting my son back. I've been there. <laughs> Uh, amen to that. Um, I've been at the house for seven months, seven and a half months, and I look forward to my life on the outside world because since I've been here, God has given me the most peace and joy that I never knew that was even possible, and I'm very thankful for the Lord. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jamie. I'm from Kokomo. I'm 43 years old and mother of four adult children. I've struggled with addiction for 22 years. Um, I've been at the house for almost three and a half months. Um, I'm thankful for Tammy and the rest of the ladies at the house, but mostly God. Being at the house of grace and having God in my life has changed me. Without God in my life, I wouldn't be where I am today. I'm grateful for what this program and God has done for me. Uh, my name's Heather and I'm from Reynolds. Um, I've struggled with my addiction for the last 20 years. My addiction started when I was 17 years old, addicted to methamphetamine. The last two years, my addiction has taken complete control of my life. <laughs> okay. The last two years, my addiction has taken complete control of my life. I found myself homeless, roaming the streets, and so far gone that I couldn't even pick up the phone to call home. I was so lost as a person. I have completely lost everything and left my boys without a mother. I was exhausted, scared, and tired of running from all my problems. I'd accumulated so much legal trouble from the poor choices I had made during my drug use that I couldn't even wrap my mind around them. After roaming all around town one day, scared and so completely worn out, I found a phone and called my mom crying, asking her to please come get me, that I was so exhausted that I just wanted her to pick me up and turn myself in. I knew then that God was the only thing keeping me alive because I should have been dead. In jail, I found God again. I know that I needed help and wanted help and that I couldn't do this alone. So I wrote to Tammy at the House of Grace telling her my story. After six months of being in jail, God brought me to the House of Grace. Since I have been here, I now know that I am worth so much more and that God loves me, forgives me, and has a better life in store for me and my family. I just want to thank God for giving me a life again and bringing me to the House of Grace. I just want to say real quick that that takes guts. If you've never had to throw it out there in front of people, things that you didn't want to share, that takes guts. And I appreciate these ladies when they do that because we want to be real. One of the things we try to teach is be real. We're being transparent. We're not hiding and covering up any longer because they've done that for so long that that's why they're in the mess they're in. That's why we get in the mess that we get in because we cover up and hide for so long. I remember years ago, I was at youth camp, and I think it was Brother Sullivan that made the comment that I'll never forget, that he said, we've got to reach our youth before we have to rescue them. That's a powerful statement. And I've never forgotten that. When I, the first day I walked in the jail to try to minister to women, I remembered that. We're in a place now of rescuing. I'm in a place of rescuing these ladies that for some reason couldn't be reached. But I know how the devil works. But I know how my God works. 
And God's doing some big things. And I just encourage you guys to, if you don't know what else to do for the House of Grace, please put us at the top of your list. I'll be selfish. Put us at the top of your list because the enemy is there to fight with everything he's got. And we refuse to let him win. But we need God's help in doing that. But I thank you for just giving us a chance to share. And one more thing is I've asked that um, I would like to throw this out as well. We're trying to find 12 churches in 12 months to come and share about the House of Grace. If your church has not invited us, please talk to me. Please let us come and share. Would you just like to share what God's doing? I'd share about how, a little bit about myself and how it all began and where God brought us to. And, and then the ladies take a little bit of time and share about their self too, just like they did tonight. But we want to get out there. We need other people to know what we're about. And we need support. We need financial support. We need material support. But we need prayer most of all. Because prayer is what's changed it. Prayer is what's brought it. And prayer is what's going to keep it. So I'm not worried about the money. That's God's job. And I'm telling the truth about that. Money's not been a problem for me to worry about. You know, God gave the vision. It's his job. And I tell him that. It's your job, not mine. So when I start getting all stirred up about something's got to be paid and we're going to have to spend $1,000 for this, it's all right, God, that's your job. You find it. And he does. Right. We spend 1000 he'll bring 1001 back. Because that's what he does. But it's not about the money. But it is about just God changing lives. But we need your support and help. But if, again, if you haven't asked us to come to share at your church, please see me. We'd love to be able to come and just show you what God's doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. I asked her on her short notice, and uh, I just felt like, you know, that it's a good thing. You guys come a long ways. I know you guys have awesome testimonies, and I believe, you know, it's good that you guys share that. People need to know. Uh, that's one thing I say a lot. You have to be transparent with people when you're speaking the gospel because they need to know. And it's true. If you're transparent with them, they'll be transparent with you, and you'll receive them a lot easier. But I also want to ask Cody Maxwell. Where are you at, man? Yeah, come up here, man. <laughs> He's been a good friend. Lafayette, you guys have a good youth pastor, a youth pastor's wife. I'm very honored to call him my friend and to be serving with them. They're awesome. Well, here's your chance, man. Chance to shine. All right. I don't know how I followed that up, but God's doing great things, it sounds like it, over there, Grace. Um, just keep praying for them, absolutely, right? All right, I'm going to try to keep this quick. So that way we can hear from Zeke tonight. Um, he just asked me recently to... I feel like I'm really loud. Um, okay. Um, just to share, just to testify. And so I prayed and prayed and prayed. And I just really felt the Lord placing the scripture uh, on my heart. And then a couple personal testimonies that kind of go along with it. So, um, super famous, super famous uh, section of scripture. Acts 3. Uh, where Peter heals the crippled beggar. It says, One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon. Now a, crippled, now, a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg for, the, for those going into the temple courts. When he had saw Peter and John about to enter, he, uh, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, Look at us. So the man gave him his attention expecting to receive something from them. You know, can you picture that? Yeah. Right, this guy's there every day, and he's just like, give me money, hello, please help me, help me. And then finally someone says, look at me. Like, I have something very important to tell you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So he gives him his attention. Verse 6, then Peter said, silver or gold I don't have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. So he took the man by the hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. Imagine that tonight. This man's been crippled from birth. No muscles, very little tendons in his bones, and at that moment that was there, it grew, it just appeared, and he was able to come up, rise, 
and walk and jump. Verse 8, he jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Full Pentecostal style, right? Come on. They recognized him as the same person, as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to them. Incredible, incredible picture of a great testimony, of, of a great story that could happen. And I believe it can happen today, right? Because God still lives, he still moves in our lives. Uh, Bishop's met word for this year is engage. And so I want to tell you a quick couple stories from my life about engaging with others. And, you know, we, we see here that um, Peter and John are going out and they, they see the world around them and they just experience the Holy Spirit fire in their life. And so they're like, you know what, we're going to engage with this world. We're going to connect with these people that we come in contact with. Every single person they came in contact with, we're going to let them know who Jesus Christ is. So there was one day, I was on my way to work a few years ago, and I decided to stop at the gas station and get a drink, something to eat. And there's this lady in front of me. Um, And so I'm like, okay, I know her. She goes to my church. She's a new family that's coming to our church. Um... She's been coming for about three months now, and so this is cool. This is, I know her, but all of a sudden, she was there with her daughter. They were buying a few, few items. It was $12 worth, um, and she was digging around in her purse. She could not find her money. And at that moment, I knew. I felt the Lord telling me, buy her things. Yeah. Buy her stuff. Engage in this moment and buy her things. And you know what my flesh did? My flesh won that day. I didn't buy her stuff. I stood there. I knew who she was. She had a student, she had a child that was in our youth ministry at the time, and I didn't do it. I regret that moment to this day. Because I didn't engage in that time with her. She looked to her daughter and she's like, I I don't have it, I don't know where my card is, I can't find it. And her daughter's like, I'll run out to the car and get it. All while the Holy Spirit is telling me, buy her stuff, do it. And I, I just didn't do it. I didn't engage in that opportunity. I missed it right? Don't miss those opportunities when you feel the Holy Spirit speaking to you to say, do this, step out in obedience and just do it. He's going to move in your life. Just like uh, Peter and John did here, they, they heard the Holy Spirit and they engaged in that man's life. And look at the change that happened to that man. A few weeks later, um, I was talking to one of my friends about it and, and he's just like, dude, Cody, you really should have done it. They're struggling financially. Man, that just hit me worse, right? Because at the, I was just like, oh, God, I missed it. Like, I drove to work that morning knowing I missed it, that I missed that opportunity to engage. And so I told myself, God, if you ever speak to me like that again, I know you will, Holy Spirit, help me to rise above my flesh and to beat that and to reach out and engage in the opportunity. A couple years later, another opportunity kind of happened. Uh, my wife worked at a tea house in Delphi, and I, I went in there for lunch that day. Um, one for good food, two for a really great waitress, um, obviously. So that's the real reason I went in there. Um, so I go in there and I sit down and um, one of my former boss's wife and their granddaughter was there. And she recognized me right away. It had been a while since I'd seen her, so I didn't really, I could, didn't make the connection. I was like, man, you look really familiar. The more we got talking, I remembered who she was. Um, And we were talking some more. I had lunch, and she had their lunch, and we were talking more. And she goes, hey, would you, she's like, you you go to church, right? And and she knew that that I was a a Christ follower and everything. And um, and so we started engaging in that talk. And she goes, can you pray for Danny, for my husband? Can you pray for him? Um, And you know, you get that a lot, right? You ever get that opportunity where maybe you're walking through the store and someone says, hey, would you pray for us? Sure thing. And then you leave that conversation and you go on and you never pray for that person, right? You always forget, and then you're just like weeks later, oh, I should have prayed for that person. I totally forgot. I said, you know what? I'm going to pray for this person. I'm going to do it right here, right now. So I did. Uh, I Right there at the tea house in the restaurant, in the middle of the restaurant, I said, Let's, is it all right with you if we go ahead and pray for him right now? And she's like, well, if you feel that's best. Well, yes, I do, right? <laughs> right? We see, we see here in the story, Peter and John are like, get up and walk, right? And so I was like, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do it. I'm going to listen to the Spirit this time. 
And so I just, I sat there, I prayed for them, uh, I lifted them up to the Lord, and I, I don't know what has ever happened to that situation. Um, but as I prayed with them, the conversation that we had afterwards was a lasting conversation. It was a, it was a moment that I believe they're going to remember forever. It was that seed that was planted in their life. It was that moment that I could actually engage in their life to where the Holy Spirit could come in and be engaged in their life. Maybe they're not going to see it for 10 years, but that seed's still there, and God's going to come back, and he's going to water it, and it's going to grow, right? Engage when the Holy Spirit tells you to engage. Because good things happen when you do that. And if you, your flesh rises up and it wins, God still loves you. He's going to give you more opportunities, right? Just pray for that person even if you miss that opportunity. Pray for them anyways. God still loves you. He's going to give you more opportunities. Amen? Amen. very thankful for my friends. I have another friend, a close friend of mine. He's been with me through a lot. He's lived with Rick, and here he is today. He came all the way from South Carolina to come out to Hoosier Town. I, I don't know why, believe me. I don't know why either, but the Lord knows. I came from, I'm a Buckeye originally, just want to let you know, and I'll always be a Buckeye. My kids will be Buckeyes too. There ain't going to be no Hoosiers. But either way, Anthony, <laughs> would you come up here and testify? Uh, I believe Rick talked about him earlier, and here he is in the flesh now. <laughs> Amen. 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 Good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. Amen. I'll tell you what, it's just good, good to be here with God's people. I, I'll tell you a little bit about me. I'm uh, Anthony Graham. I'm 30 years old, and I've been serving the Lord for about seven years now. And uh, the Lord called me to preach, and I, and, uh, I ran from it for a while. I, I figured, where am I going to run to? And I just give in. I just give in. I give in to the Lord. I started serving Him. I started getting in. And I tell you what, that's, that's what I've been feeling in this place. That last night, just dig in. We just got to dig in. Amen? I tell you what, when we went to Bible school, me, Zeke, and Monica, Monica didn't have the privilege, but... We've told her many stories about Pops and Mima, our, our dorm directors. They overseed us and you know, kept us in line. You know, you know how Bible school students get. <laughs> but uh, he'd tell the story every morning. And, he, and he, he learned it. He learned in us. That's a little southern thing. But anyway, he'd sow into us every morning, Psalms 91. And the story about, about a regiment of soldiers, they would dig in. And they would, they would quote that before they would go on the battlefield. And because of that, because of their tenacity and their faith and their trust in the Lord, not a single one got injured, killed, but they all made it through. Because they dug in. And that's what we got to do tonight, church. We got to dig into this service. We got to get with Brother Zeke here. We got to get with the Word of God and what He's going to sow in our life. Amen? You know, I, that's what I felt throughout my life. It's, it, it, it was, if I don't dig in, if I don't yearn for the things of God, if I didn't seek after Him, I just felt stale and unused because I was sitting there. I was wanting something from the Lord, but I had my hands closed. I had my hands closed. I was reaching out, but I was holding on to something at all. I was, I was holding on to things that I thought I could handle. But when I finally let go, he could dig in. God could dig in a little with me, amen. He could get into those things that, that I was holding on to. He could dig out in myself and put, a more, put more him in me, amen. Amen. He's just been so good to me. He's just been so good. I, you know, every time I get up, every time I'm speaking about the Lord, and I'm not ashamed of it, but my cup over, just overruns. I love that song, my, my cup overfloweth. Because I just have a joy. I have a joy that this world just cannot handle, amen. Unless they get a hold of Christ, amen. 
But I love the Lord. He's just been so good to me. He's, he's continue working in my family. My mom and dad aren't saved. I continue to serve the Lord. They support me 100%. But they're not where they're at. And I'm believing the Lord's coming. He's, he's working on them. Because I'm seeking and praying. I'm trusting in Him. That they're going to start digging in too. And we can dig in tonight, church. We can dig in tonight. I know Zeke's been telling me about today, you know, it's, it's it, it just business and all. You know, you have a little bit of preaching. You know, you're tired. But when, that's when the devil will get to you the most. Like, like Cody said, you know, we just back up and let the flesh go. Let, let the flesh take over. You know, we're tired right now. We're, we feel like we can't get in. But if we dig in a little bit more, if we dig in a little more, that's when the Lord will bless you. Amen. And I thank, I'm also thankful for Brother Rick here. He's been just been a good friend I've I've acquired here. You know, I come to I come and preach the morning services at the Eight Mile Camp down there, and uh, I told I went back to my church. I said, "Man, that feels like home," and I went for no reason. As on my way back, the Lord said, "Brother, you got to move to Indiana." And I said, "Okay, Lord, I'm, I'm gonna do it." I said, "I'm I'm gonna move, and I, I'm just trusting in you." Didn't know, didn't have a job, didn't have a place to stay. The Lord's just opening up doors. I've already got me a job. I'm working on a place to stay. I've got me a good home church with Brother Terry and Sister Spr Spr Sprouse there. He's just opening doors because I put my trust in him. Because I dug in a little bit. It seemed like I was alone out there. That's how that's how it felt. Felt like I was alone out there. I had the Lord, but I'm just I'm just out here. First time I flew on a plane. I just felt like I was just, just about that big. But I was holding on to the Lord. And that's all that matters. If we got the Lord, we got everything. Yes. Amen. Amen. I love you guys. Appreciate you. Let's get in with Brother Zeke tonight. Because he's got a word from the Lord. I know, I know the Lord's just sowed into him. He wants to flow through him to us. Amen. Amen. Well, let's just get in with him. Appreciate y'all. Now, last but not least, my wonderful bride, my better half. She already knows I was going to call her up here. I always call her up whenever I have to preach. She can speak more than what I can say, or she can speak more within uh, three seconds than I can do in 30 minutes. But, come on. <laughs> Ain't no need to be afraid. They know you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I love the Lord, and I'm shaking. <laughs> I love the Lord. I'm thankful to be here. Um, I'm going to start off by saying I have no idea why I'm about to share this. Um, I sat there and tried to think of something else, and I couldn't think of anything else, and I kept going back to this, and again, no idea why I'm about to share it. But that's what the Lord has put on my heart, and my heart is pounding. Maybe it's just because I was struggling with it. Very well could be just because of me. Probably is, but <laughs> so bear with me. Um, I don't even know where to start. Um, recently, um, I have a family member I'm very close to um, has been out of church for a long time. Um, I've been praying him, for him for uh, many, many years. And um, he recently did get back into church and is now saved again, which I'm very thankful for. But he's going through a very hard time right now. And just maybe a week or two before he did get saved and back in church, um, I'd pray for him every day on my way to work. And um, I started praying, Lord, do whatever it takes to get him in church, except for this one thing. Don't let that happen. And um, I kept praying that because I thought surely that couldn't be God's will for that to happen in order for him to come back to church. And um, that thing did happen. And at first I was angry. I was very angry. I, was, I know you're not supposed to question God, but I was because I couldn't understand why that would happen. 
I specifically prayed for that not to happen, and I know God hears us, and I know he answers. So I couldn't understand why he didn't answer that. And um, it was actually about just a week after that um, this person did come back to church and needed to get, to get saved. So then at that point, I realized that I was being... I wasn't praying right, obviously, because that's what needed to happen to get that person's attention. And now, even though it's still hard, I'm thankful that that did happen because that's what it took. But I don't like to see the struggle that they're still going through. And um, it would seem that things would start to get better and then it would get worse again. It would go back and forth. And I couldn't understand in my mind why all this was happening. They're back in church now, God. You can make this all go away. You can restore everything. And it can be roses. It can be great. And it wasn't. And I couldn't understand. But, um, and there was actually just another thing that was sort of frustra- frustrating me yesterday with the situation. And, um, I knew that he was probably going to call on me. He normally does. And so I was trying to, like, prepare myself for what I might want to say. And I have a Bible with me that I had when I was younger. And I was flipping through, and I had highlighted in this one. And, you know, I'm still thinking on yesterday and just how I'm still frustrated. And I don't understand what God is doing. And one of the places that I highlighted in September of 2008 is 1 Corinthians 2.5, and it says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yeah. And you know, in my mind, I couldn't understand, my mind couldn't wrap around it why all this was happening. But that verse says that it doesn't have to make sense in my mind. God knows what he's doing. God is bigger than it all. He knows what it has to take. And even though that this person, thank you, even though this person is back in church and they are doing better, God is really helping them. But there's still someone else that needs to be reached through this. And to be quite honest, I don't know what it's going to take, and I'm scared because I know that what it could take could be devastating. But I've seen already that if that's what it takes, it'll be worth it. I'm not going to like it. I'm not going to like it at all, but if it brings a soul to the Lord and it saves someone from eternity in a burning hell, it's going to be worth it. And you know, when we were singing in worship, I only write down a ton of stuff and I had one sentence written down. I didn't even know if it would make sense with what I was saying. But I wrote down, and I believe it's what Sister Julie said, he's perfect in all of his ways, even when we don't understand his ways. And you know, right right now, I still don't understand. I still don't have answers. And yeah, that bothers me. But Corinthians tells me that my wisdom doesn't matter. It means nothing compared to the power of God. So, you know, whatever you might be going through, because everybody's going through something. Everybody sitting here has something. It's not exactly what I'm going through, but you have your own thing. You know what it is. You're thinking of it right now. I know it's hard because I still have not conquered that, but it doesn't have to make sense to you. If you truly give it to God and you trust in His all-knowing, almighty power, He'll keep you. He'll hold you when you're crying like a baby. He'll give you peace that can only come from Him. So whatever it is that your wisdom can't comprehend right now on earth, put it in the power of God and He'll take care of it. Hallelujah. I'm thankful for her. She prays for me constantly. Pray for her. She has to deal with me. I ain't that bad, though. I ain't gonna lie. At least I don't think I am. Uh, <clears throat> once again, I'm very thankful for the Lord and allowing me to be here, be before you guys, and to be able to speak His word. 
Uh, I said it before, I don't take it lightly because, uh, you know, I'm the least of these. There's many other people here that can preach way better than I and they can, you know, expound way better than I. But I'm glad the Lord chose me for a time such as this. And uh, I do have a word. <laughs> and uh, like I said, it, you got to be transparent. And I had a hard time. I got the got this thought last week and then uh, it was kind of weird. I told a couple people it was kind of weird how I got this. I got my, uh, my title and I got my first point and then I got my third point. And I'm like okay, what about my second point? You can't just jump to three automatically. And then so he gave it to me this morning at five o'clock in the morning. And I was like okay, let's, let's go ahead. And then everything that has been done throughout the day has lined up. Everything in the service has lined up according to exactly what I'm going to speak on. And I believe that, you know, I was a little bit concerned yesterday, and I was kind of a little bit worried. I was like, you know, this is a youth service, but this is not youth related, or you can't rely it, or, you know, relate it to youth. And so I was like, you know what? I don't know, Lord. You gotta help. You gotta help me on this one. But I believe someone needs to hear this, even if it's my own self. Uh, Revelations chapter three. Is, uh, we're gonna actually. I actually have three portions of scripture. Revelations chapter three and verse twenty. Uh, Matthew chapter twelve. 43 and 45, and also John 10 and 10. Uh, once again, I'm very thankful for the board, everybody that's here, everybody that's helped me throughout, you know, this one-year trial, and uh, I'm very thankful for what the Lord is going to do in our, our young people's lives and in the lives of you guys. You know, all of our youth service, I want to tell you this, you guys are more than welcome to come. In fact, I like when you guys come, because it, yeah. it kind of helps me out. It makes me feel a little bit better, you know. But <laughs> I am nervous. I ain't going to lie to you. I always get nervous when I'm preaching the Word of God and to, uh, you know, new faces, new people, and new area. Uh, but I believe, like I said, I got a word. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. If you have it, say amen. amen. And it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. And I will sup with him and him with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and he and and I and am set down with my father in in his throne. Matthew chapter twelve, verse forty three and forty five. If you would turn there, if you got it, say amen. Okay, I didn't get a lot of amens, but I'll give you guys some time. <laughs> Once again, thank you guys for everything that you're doing, everything that you have done for me. I appreciate it. Matthew chapter 12, verse 43 and 45, or 245. You have it, say amen. Okay, a lot better. Amen. When an unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he come and findeth it empty, swept, and garnished, then he goeth and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. That sounds really bad. It is really bad. But John chapter 10 and verse 10 is something that we should know, quote, on a daily. If you don't know it, quote it. <laughs> Find it, learn it, quote it. Uh, John chapter 10 and verse 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Hallelujah. Like I said, thank you guys for all, all that came out supporting us, being here with us. I know many of us have a busy work week throughout this week and those that got up early to come here for tonight's service and you know, I know I didn't have to work today but it felt like I worked today. And uh, once again, I, I'll do my best to let God have his way and get, out, and get out of the way. Once again, thank you guys. Thank you, Bishop, for allowing me to be here and, and preach. I'm very honored. And thank you for those that allowed us to be here at Lafayette. Brother Black, Sister Black, thank you. I appreciate it a lot. But I'm going to get into this. We see in this passage we have read is a warning that's being presented to ourselves here tonight. We see that the scripture, there is a known adversary trying his best to knock you down and get you to fall down. But now is not the time to waver. Now is not the time to stay down. Yes, times are going to be tough. Yes, things are going to get hard. Yes, they're going to knock you down. They're going to stumble you. But it's okay. Dust it off and get back up. It's going to be all right. 
the title for this sermon, like I said, uh, the Lord gave it to me a week ago, is not, Who's Knocking at Your Door? Now, many of us have been here for a while, like I said today, and I'm not going to take long. I'm going to get out of the way. But my first point is, it's time to close the door to your heart. We see in the passage we have read is a warning, like I said, that's being presented to us. We see that there's also a task that we must have to follow or must do to, uh, for that warning. And that we must close all the doors, all the windows that are in our lives that the devil will try to knock down first with your heart. He knows if he can get to your heart, he can get to your mind, and then he can get to your outer. But you have to be careful. The Bible says the heart is wicked and deceitful. Jeremiah 17 and 9 says, says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? He asks, who can know it? Only God can know it. And if you have to let him close that door. There's only room for one person in that door. Like I said, the first passage I read, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come to him. You have to realize that the devil is going to come to you in such a way to try to deceive you, to try to get you to trip up, but you can't let that happen to you. We have to be on guard 24-7. There's more time. There's no more time for wasting. The devil is slick and he is cunning. I'm not trying to give glory to him or anything, but we have to know our adversary. You have to know your enemy. Because if you don't know your enemy, you can't study and you can't fight. It's just a proven fact. So we have to be on alert and be on guard 24-7. We see the devil throughout scriptures is trying his very best to mimic the things that are holy and pure and true, but he cannot simply do that because there's nothing holy in him. You know, there's going to be times where things are going to be knocking at your door. You have to watch out. You have to be careful. You have to close those doors. You have to close everything. Shut it all up. There ain't no time to be wasting no more. So we must do the same to guard our heart continually and put it underneath submission to God. Because even our heart will try to deceive us. Even our own flesh will get in the way, like Cody said. I'm telling you, who's knocking at your door? There's two people you can say that are knocking, some good, some bad, but you have to be watching. You know, I believe many of our doors, they have that little peep sight that you can look through. You can see from like a little distance, just a very few. If someone's knocking, you can be like, okay, who's there? Oh, okay, that's my friend. Let me go ahead and let him in. But if you don't know him, you ain't going to let him in, right? Okay. You know, as a kid, I was growing up, I grew up in the ghetto. I ain't going to lie to you. I grew up in Lorraine, Ohio. If you don't know where Lorraine's at, it is the ghetto. <laughs> and so my mom, <laughs> yeah, I'm a ghetto. I grew up in the ghetto, but I'm not a ghetto boy. It's all right. <laughs> but, uh, you know, as a kid, uh, when someone would come to our door, our house, and knock at our front door, I remember my mom and dad giving me a warning to be careful and watch because not everyone comes into our home. The same has to go for ourselves. We must watch and see who's knocking at the door because the enemy is trying his best to destroy you. He's tried his best with you guys time and time again. And look where you're at now, right where God wants you. I'm very thankful for you guys, and you guys have spoke, you spoke well. We needed to hear that. I'm very thankful for you guys. You guys keep holding on, too. But he's given us a warning to be mindful and to be watching because our adversary is trying his very best to come into our home. He knows that if he can get just a little bit in, he'll soon blow that door down, the rest of the door down. The devil is very, a, a successful trickster. He's doing his best. He's been doing this for many years now, and he has different tactics, you can say. But this is a different time we're living in. You may ask, why is it different? It's different because we must now choose who we let in our life right now. We must choose, like I said, if it's going to be good or if it's going to be bad. We see that in our second, test after, our second text after we get delivered again and gain the victory from things in our lives, we will come, it will come back to check on us and check us out. When the unclean spirit, the Bible says, is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return to my house from whence I came out. He's coming to check on you from time to time. You know, I've been serving the Lord for quite some time now. Since the age of 12, I, that's when I really gave my heart to the Lord. And he came and checked on me multiple times. Sometimes, you know, I let him in being stupid, and I fell down, but I got back up. Thank God. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, who's knocking at your door? Hallelujah. We cannot afford to let him in. There's only enough room for God and him alone and nothing else. Not your job, not your husband, not your kids, not your sports that you're involved in. Nothing but God and Him alone. 
Don't get me wrong, I like these things that matter. And in fact, I like playing games. I'm not very athletic as I used to be, but I do like playing games. I do like hanging out with people, and I do like my wife a lot. But let me tell you, if it's her or my salvation, I'm going to take my salvation before I take her. Because she ain't going to get me to heaven. Only he will. Second, it's time to close the doors to your relationships. Not only do we have to close the doors to our heart, but we must close the doors to our, our relationships. You may be thinking, you know what? What is he talking about, about your relationships? You know, people come into your lives just to check on you. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. Half the time I've seen it, some of them have been bad. <laughs> so you got to watch, you got to be careful. You may be thinking, what do I mean? Like I said, people, you have to watch who you allow come into your life. I can't get away from that. We must guard who we let in because not everyone is good for you. There's a pressure to conform to the things of this world, the people around you, in your workplace, in your school, in your classes, in your everyday life. You have to watch. You have to watch and be careful. You know what? I'm sorry to say it like this. I came across some friends in my workplace that I knew from day one. We ain't going to click. You ain't going to click with everybody. You know, a lot of this time and age, this generation, they want everybody to like them. It sounds funny, you know, because... On Facebook, oh, they're liking my posts, nice. And my Instagram, they're liking this. Man, I have 68 likes on this one post. Not everybody's going to like you. I'm going to tell you that right now. And if they do, some of them are just watching you. You have to watch out. You have to watch out. Not everybody there is good. It's for the good reasons and good intentions. The devil will come and so sneaky and so sly to try to trip you up. you got to be watching. Who's knocking at your door? I'm trying to get it to you guys. You must close the door to relationships. I'm not saying you can't, you can't front, uh, befriend them or, be, or be, be friends with them or talk to them, but you have to be on guard even when you're doing so. Because we are in a spiritual warfare. We've all been engaged in a spiritual warfare since the day we got up to the day we go to sleep, to the day we got saved. You're engaged in a spiritual warfare. A warfare. You know what? You may think, you know what? We are in a war, but you can't see this war. And if you were, it would probably scare you. <laughs> It'll probably scare you. Because there's, there's things waiting there for you. The devil, like I said, will come and check up on you. Even when you're sleeping, waiting for you to get you. You have to be watching. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2 and 9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye may, or ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. He calls us a different people, a peculiar people. We are different. Once we, uh, I notice in my life through times in different workplaces, people notice, hey, this guy is different. You don't say these things around him. You don't do these things around him. And you know, sometimes I, I feel bad. I catch myself, as, you know, that's you. You can do that. It ain't going to affect me. But you know what? I'm still on guard constantly. Amen. Those that don't go to church, they know who I am. Even in the workplace, I'm actually... I'm a contractor, so, or not a con I'm an inspector, so I watch contractors, and I meet up with a lot of people. And even those same people, they'd be like, hey, you can't do that around him. He, he's different. Let me tell you, when you get saved, you're different. You're not meant to blend in with the crowd. You're not meant to give in. You're not meant to be liked. <laughs> Jesus, he wasn't liked. That means you ain't going to be like if you're trying to be like Jesus. He says you have to be, up, be set apart from your old, lifestyle, your old lifestyle. You should not be mingling around with those people you used to hang out with. You shouldn't be running around with those old people you used to run around with. But it's time to close the door in your relationship. He sets you aside from everybody else in a special place, a special category, a different from everybody else. He sets you aside. So who's knocking at your door? Point number three. It's time to close the door to your family. We see the family in today's age. The family has been under attack in such a way that we can't even comprehend no more. We see relationships, people you thought were strong spiritually in the Lord falling by the wayside. We see pillars in the church falling by the wayside. We see many people in churches across the face of the earth falling by the wayside. It's time to watch who is knocking at your door. Who is knocking at your door? We see so many people giving up on their marriage. The divorce rate is so high because many people have lost sight of their first love. You may be thinking, what is your first love? Let me tell you, it's Jesus Christ. 
It is Jesus Christ. Now is not the time to start losing sight of what matters the most. It's time to close the door to your family. The devil knows if he can destroy your home, starting with the mother and the father, he can destroy the lineage after that. Like I said earlier, now is not the time to play games. Now is not the time to just give up and give in. Too many people are giving in. People that I went to Bible school with giving in over stupid stuff. Now is not the time. Mm. I'm telling you, who is knocking at your door? If someone would come to the piano, prepare for us a song. There's a spiritual warfare going on right now in here. You may be like, what, in church? Yeah, in church. God only gives them so much power. Even as he, when Job was going through that trial before all that, he had the sons of God all come up there and the devil came along with them. And he said, have you considered my servant Job? You know what he said? He said, yeah, you know what? He lied to him up there, walking to and fro. He knows exactly who Job was. He knew exactly where he was at. And he knew that God had a hedge around him and he couldn't do nothing. Let me tell you, we let the devil come knocking on our door. We let him in. It's so easy. Now's not the time to let him in. Now is not the time to give up. Oh. But it's time to engage the enemy. It's time that we stand up, not looking to the left or nor to the right, not wavering. But it's time we fight. It's time we engage our enemy in such a way that, you know, it's going to knock him off. He ain't even going to know what to do. If you guys would all stand. I'm very thankful for the Lord. I don't know who this was for, but let me tell you. If you let things come into your life and you say, man, you know what? I messed up way too many times. Oh, precious Lamb of God. You're not too far gone. You haven't gone too far. You haven't did nothing. But the devil, that the Lord doesn't know. He knows exactly where you're at. He knows your exact need. And in fact, I preached on this when Jesus was up there hanging on the cross. Before he can get all that, when he was in the garden, he asked his father, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. He asked him three times. The Bible says three times. If it be possible, let this cup. Because what's in that cup was every sin of this world, every person that sinned, every known sin. He had to partake of that. And then, you know, the Bible says after you partake of sin, next comes death. So he knew if him partaking in that sin, he that knew no sin was made to be sin for us. So next, after, you know, everything felt good taking in that sin, next comes the death. He knew that there would be nobody else that can do this but him alone. Like I said, you haven't gone too far. You may be like, man, I messed up. I messed up too, but thank the Lord he, he knew where I was at. And in fact, he had his hand already stretched out waiting for me to pick it back up. Like I said, I'm the least of these. Just like the prodigal son. He had somebody knocking on his door one day. And he decided to let him in. He seen that far country from a way off. And he placed it in his heart. He forgot, you know what, I'm living in my father's house. We don't do those type of things in, in here. We don't do those things. We don't partake in, those, in that lifestyle, that righteous lifestyle. Like I said, who's knocking at your door tonight? Hallelujah. If everybody, every head bowed and eyes closed, You know who you are. You know your need. You may be thinking, you know what, preacher? I can't do that. I've gone too far. You haven't gone too far, friend. If you all close your eyes, bow our heads. You know what? Between you and the Lord, you know who you are. If you messed up, you still got time. 
you still got time. He's not finished with you, but he's just started a work. He's the only one that could take a mess and turn it into a message. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you're doing and everything that you have done. I pray, Lord, that you help each and every one of us here tonight. Help us, Lord, to watch and guard our heart, guard our mind. When those things come knocking at our door, Lord, help us. Help us, Lord, to be vigilant, to be on our toes, Lord, even when we're tired spiritually. Oh, precious Lamb of God, have your way. If you've been going through a trial, I know many of us have. You know what? God's here for you right now. He is here for you, and He wants to help you. But the thing is, you have to let Him help you. If you don't, I'm telling you. I felt His presence this morning, and I'm telling you, He is here. And He's wanted to do work. If you've been going through it, just sign, lift your hand up. I, you know, I'm going to lie to you. I've been going through it. We're living in a time where it's rough. Things are hard. The enemy's coming in attack. You have to stand strong. Now is not the time to give in. Oh, would you guys come find you a place to pray? The Lord's going to help you here tonight. I believe it. Would you come? Thank you, Lord. Amen.
Let's give God praise. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Give Him praise, church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He is worthy. He is worthy. Amen. Hallelujah. I tell you right now, this young man's getting loose. He's getting loose on us. That is a word now. He just brought us a word. Amen. He's starting to break loose. He's coming out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look out. Every time you see him, you're going to see a little bit more of what God is doing in him. Amen. Do you appreciate that word today? Come on. Come on. Let your brother know. Let your brother know. Amen. Appreciate Ezekiel. 
appreciate Ezekiel. Amen. I remember the very first time I ever stood up to say anything for God. And the only reason I stood up is because he made me hyperventilate, so I had to get up and say something. And I stood up and I said, I love the Lord or something like that, and I hurried up and sat down. That was my big start. Amen. So I'm going to tell you right now, I see that young man growing. And I know why he's growing. Well, I mean, I know Momo's getting him in line, but... <laughs> Momo, you never cease to amaze me. I have never really seen her like that, Mom. She was bearing her heart. She let the walls down. And she let us experience what she was experiencing. Amen? When somebody does that in front of you, you should cherish that. Don't ever take that moment for granted. And don't ever use that moment against them. Amen. Always take it to prayer in the Lord. Amen. Amen? That's why she shared that. It was heart to heart. That's heart to heart. That's as good as it gets. That's as real as you will ever see. Before we change the order here, uh, we do have a, uh, I believe, a sincere situation uh, Brother Black believes a sincere situation, and I agree. Um, we would like for Brother Dan Van Hoosier, if you would come up here, please. Uh, we're going to ask him, Pastor, will you get the oil? We're going to ask him, church, to stand in for his mom-in-law. Amen. Uh, I'm not going to tell you everything, but, uh, you know, the fact is she's in the hospital, and she needs a touch of the Lord. Uh, also pray for his wife, which that's her mama that's in the hospital. Amen. And we're just asking you to agree with us. Look how they're coming around, Brother Dan. I see unity in this church. Amen. Okay. Okay, sis. Glory to the Lord thy God, that you 
Jesus. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever, and I have never changed. Trust me and know that I am God and I am with her. I have not left her, I have not forsaken her, but I am with her, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We have two, two more orders of business for the convention. And one of them right now we will move to. I want to receive an offering for this service tonight. But I will tell you up front. This offering will go to your DYD, Ezekiel Rosado, and his wife. Amen? This offering will go to Ezekiel and his wife. They were just reelected today as your district youth directors. And uh, we want to take up an offering for them. We ask that you would give in abundance and let them know how much we support them. And we bless them. After the offering, we will let you stretch your legs while we prepare for the ordination. It will take us about maybe 10 minutes, 15 at the most, to get ourselves prepared. And then we will start the ceremony of the ordination. Okay? So, right now, if I need a couple ushers, maybe three ushers. If you'll come and help us out, please. Come on. Need some big, strong men because you're going to have to carry a lot of money. Need some big, strong men. Hallelujah. Come on. <laughs> Just tell them to bring it to you, brother. Amen. All right. Father God, we have heard the word of the Lord from this young man tonight. God, this district has put their vote of confidence once together, once again bringing together their unity to put their faith and trust in this man. God, we believe that you led us and give us guidance to be able to vote in our conscience clearly that this is who you chose. And now, Lord, we desire to show forth our blessing. We desire, God, that you would bless this basket and cause it to prosper in Jesus' holy name. Amen and amen. Come here, Brother Anthony. Don't ever forget to take his money. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Go ahead, brother. Play him some getting money music. Yeah. <laughs> Play it fast. Maybe we'll get more.
Do you believe that? I believe it. Come on. I believe it, Brother Bobby. I'm going to fly away. Hallelujah. When I die, hallelujah, bye, bye. Hallelujah. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. Amen. Going to take some power to get this frame up off the ground. And I believe he can do it. Amen. If he can cause me to pass from death unto life, take an old stony heart and turn it into a heart of flesh that he can speak to and train and pluck. Uh, put in his hand and shape it and mold it and cause something good to come out of that old dark heart, he can cause us to fly away. Soon and very soon, we're going to see the king. Are you ready? Are you ready? Hallelujah. All right. All those who are in the ordination, we're going out there, and my wife is going to start buzzing around like a bumblebee, getting you ready. Everybody else, you can go and stretch your legs for a few minutes and then come back in here, okay? We've got about 10 minutes, maybe 15 at the most. Brother Bobby, you're out there.